If you compare beer with bratwurst. And cheese with wine. Or even whiskey. With donuts. Then we think you can pair all of these delicious drinks with... Murder. Conspiracies. Missing persons. And more. Drink with us as you feed your craving for true crime and creepy stories. Welcome back to Perfectly Paired With. This is a podcast where my lovely wife over here, Catherine, also known as Katie. um, Well, you should call her Katie. (laughs) She doesn't like Catherine, even though her mama gave her that name. And myself, Jason, we um, we sit down and do what we uh, would be doing even if we weren't doing a podcast. And that would be Katie telling me a true crime story about something that she's learned <laughs> in uh, vast detail. And, um, you know, I'd say, hold on, I let me go get a drink for this. And, uh, you know, I'd ask her questions and stuff as we go on. And that's exactly what we do. But we do pair a drink with each story. So... Uh, Katie, why don't you give us a little, little tidbit about, obviously we're con- also, we are continuing a story. So if you haven't listened to this, uh, last episode, go listen to that Ted Bundy part one. Um, and Katie, tell us a little bit about what we can expect out of part two. When Ted Bundy moved from Washington to Utah, he left behind him a bloody trail of victims and an entire community of police officers looking for the monster who is abducting college-age girls. He also left behind him a growing suspicion that the Ted who feigned various injuries in order to lure his victims into a bronze Volkswagen bug just might be the same good-looking, charismatic Ted Bundy who had been in a long-term relationship with a single mother, the same seemingly normal guy with movie star good looks who just so happened to be friends with the writer who is collecting information about the missing college aged girls. There we go. Oh, Ted Bundy is, um, it's a story. I think everybody thinks like they know, they at least know of him. They know of maybe some of the things he did, but you seriously couldn't watch maybe, you know, four documentaries of Tim, Ted Bundy in a row Mm -hmm. and remember the details five years later. There's, so much to it um the guy was insane and but also incredibly smart which you know psycho uh killer insanity combined with intelligence is not good for the general public <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah you know uh, here we go with the uh greatest of them all when it comes Don't to killers call him the goat um, people find that triggering well let him get triggered <laughs> just wait till i put it on a shirt <laughs> <laughs> that's right i think uh i think most of you um true ki- crime buffs and you know obsessed with listening to the podcast and whatnot uh you can kind of appreciate that you know you're listening to different stories of these guys that killed in different ways and you know they're all caught pretty quickly um they don't quite get to his numbers i'm not saying all of them it's definitely some uh but the way he did it and the fact that i mean you'll get into it but the fact that he could have done more (laughs) had luck not been on uh for once on uh on uh police's the the police's side Mm -hmm. but i'm curious what did you choose to drink with the second half of our ted bundy story yeah, so this one, uh, we're doing a mixed drink. This one's a pretty easy one. Uh, I, I well, I if we like it, I suggest try it. We have not <laughs> we tried haven't tasted it, it. <laughs> uh, but if we like it, I would say suggest you know what, go and get the ingredients and make it. It's pretty simple. Um, this drink is called Death Row, which is absolutely fitting considering this story will end with ted bundy living yep many years on death row and i knew that i knew we'd get to death row with him and uh, i thought you know that just makes sense <laughs> so uh this drink was created by a woman named monica carbonell uh, and she posted to a website called liquid culture so mm. if you want to check out uh why she made it and and all the different things, maybe ingredients, we'll post it on our Instagram. Uh, go check out 
liquid culture. So death row, just real quickly, it's a combination of uh, Blanco tequila, Campari, which you don't see in a lot of drinks. No. Uh, that's why they're, that gives it that red. Um, uh, fresh lemon juice, simple syrup, and get this, IPA. What the heck? <laughs> so finally, I might have found a way to get my wife to actually enjoy an IPA or part of an IPA. So um, to you and to uh, death row. Death row. Interesting. I feel like I need to comment right away and I don't know if I can. Yeah, same here. I'm, I'm taking it in. Um, I, it tastes like grapefruit juice. Yeah. Like I'm having a moment where no it feels it. like I'm drinking grapefruit juice. There's no grapefruit. In this. Like I feel like it's Even a Saturday IPA. morning <laughs> at 6 a.m. and I'm squeezing Weird. grapefruits. Zero IPA flavor in it. Um, yeah. I, that's what I could think of is grapefruit. Oh my um, goodness. It's really gracious. good. It's really good. I like it. Um, it's very uh, refreshing. Oh, it's super refreshing. Definitely for our hot muggy day today. This is perfect. I'm so completely confused by this beverage. Oh, that's crazy. It's grapefruit juice. Yeah. And we use an incredibly uh, unhealthy grapefruit juice <laughs> that, that will make you feeling better <laughs> after you drink it than when you start it. Yeah. I, I'm assuming. I used um, one of my favorite IPAs too, the Insane Rush by Bootstrap. Holy um, smokes. And what you is can't happening? taste it at all. <laughs> That's I don't great. Even know. Uh, she did say, like, you have to use an IPA for this and a hoppy one. That's why I chose that one because I was like, ah, it, I would hoppy. like to call her and ask um, her why the heck she came she up. She said with if this. you use a light beer or an ale, it it'll mess up all the flavor. That That's is, amazing. That is lovely. She is uh, uh, like a mixologist. Yeah, something like that. She, she labels herself on mm. the website. So yeah, go check her out. Look at culture. Look up death row. I'm digging it. Well. A drink that's surprisingly intriguing called Death Row is absolutely perfectly paired with a story about a man who is unsurprisingly intriguing who will wind up on Death Row. So in the fall of 1974, Bundy started studying law at the University of Utah. But this new life did not drive out the old Bundy or his murderous compulsions. On October 2nd, 1974, 16-year-old Nancy Wilcox left her home in Holiday, Utah to buy a pack of chewing gum. She was wearing blue corduroy pants and a, I'm sure, very 70s blouse. Nancy was last seen riding in what was described as a yellow Volkswagen. The man driving the bug could not be identified by those who saw her riding with him. Bundy confessed to killing Nancy shortly before his execution but Ted could not remember where he left her body. So to this day, Nancy's remains have never been recovered. Then on October 18, 1974, 17-year-old Melissa Smith, who had enjoyed an evening with her friends at a pizzeria parlor in Midvale, Utah, left the parlor around 9.30 p.m. and started her walk home. But she would never make it. A deer hunter would find Melissa's nude body nine days later on a hillside in Summit Park. Melissa's cause of death was determined to be multiple blows to her head, which caused severe brain hemorrhages. She had also been raped and sodomized. One of her stockings was found tied around her neck, indicating that at some point during the attack, she had also been strangled. Melissa was another victim whom Bundy would confess to abducting, raping, and murdering, just days prior to his execution. Next, Bundy would find 17-year-old Laura Amy. She would become his 11th known victim. After celebrating Halloween at a party, Laura left shortly after midnight on November 1st with the intention of hitchhiking home, the perfect prey for an unassuming handsome man driving a VW Bug. It would be Thanksgiving of that year that Laura's remains were discovered. Again, Bundy would confess to that rape and murder. On the same day that Laura's remains were officially identified using dental records, Bundy would finally make a critical mistake. On the 8th of November, 1974, Carol Durant 
found herself browsing shelves in a bookstore at her local mall. It was in that bookstore that she was approached by Ted Bundy, who identified himself as a police officer. Fake officer Ted Bundy told Carol that someone had tried to break into her vehicle. But when Carol followed Ted to her car, she would realize that nothing had actually been taken. What's more, the man who is alleged to have been a police officer smelled a lot like alcohol. And instead of driving a police cruiser, he was driving a Volkswagen bug. But despite all of these red flags, the authentic looking badge used by Bundy seemed to keep Carol's concerns at bay. Now, I do want to mention and discuss that Bundy himself would admit to being rather intoxicated during most of his attacks, which is just incredibly curious to me. Was it that he needed to build up liquid courage or the monster that was the serial killer only came out when he was drunk? Or I just don't know. It seems so counterintuitive for somebody who so clearly enjoyed and was so skilled at the act. Why would he want to participate through a haze of alcohol? Uh, if, if I had a guess, it, maybe a little bit of both, you know, building up a tiny bit of liquid courage. Um, but I, I would just imagine that the alcohol actually brought out the monster. And maybe he drank alcohol to bring out the monster, which could be that liquid courage part of it. Um, you know, there, there's some people, I mean, I'm sure we all know somebody or maybe we're one of them can think of one of our own where, you know, there's something you do that you don't normally do sober when you're drunk. Um, it can be little <laughs> things, it can be big things. But I can think of like some funny things maybe some of my friends do. Like mm-hmm. if they get to a certain point, it's like inevitably, ined- ined- geez. <laughs> inevitably, they are <laughs> and going. some people mispronounce <laughs> words when they've had a That's beverage. That's my thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, they're inevitably going to be, you know, uh, uh, pissing outside on something, you know, whatever it is. Um, maybe his is, he turns into a murderer. It's just something connected to a story that I've never been able to like rectify in my own mind. And maybe that's because my relationship with alcohol is different from his. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. Uh, I hope I, ju- I, I, I haven't noticed you missing <laughs> weird times. I night, don't so. understand that notion. No, it's I never he, I don't think I ever really thought about that part because I did know he was quite a bit of an alcoholic. My mind also goes to what if he wasn't an alcohol. What if he never touched alcohol? So would this happen? As I was listening to um, The Stranger Beside Me by Ann Rule, yeah. which is, I think, the best telling of Ted Bundy's story, except for this one, obviously. Um, she mentioned that I meant to bookmark it so I could go back and tell you about this drink that after he escaped, spoiler, he's going to escape at some point. They had started this drink for Ted Bundy's escape that involved like two Mexican jumping beans that you put inside. Cause they were like, for sure he went to Mexico. Oh, how funny. And when I went to find it online, what popped up was would Ted Bundy be Ted Bundy without alcohol? Mm. And I don't think that's what we're going to dive into considering half of our show <laughs> involves alcohol and we don't need to, <laughs> well, to we- get on that <laughs> soapbox, but it's just, it's a part of his story that I don't think I'll ever understand. Because he seems like such a skilled, intentional killer that he does it to satisfy such a specific part of him that I can't imagine he would need alcohol or that he would want that to be some sort of filter that he acted through. And I know you and I aren't going to solve this. However, if you all have ideas, I would love to hear them in the comments Yeah, because that's one part of his story I don't think I'll ever understand. Yeah. No, I, I, and I would love to see other people's yeah. ideas of what, you know, what it meant and yes. could it have been different. Yeah. All right. So back to Carol DeRanche. So Carol got into the bug and the two drove off into the night. However, when Bundy did not drive to a police station and instead pulled off the road near an elementary school, Carol began to panic. Yeah, that part again. So Carol got into the bug and the two drove off into the night. However, when Bundy did not drive to a police station and instead pulled off the road near an elementary school, Carol began to panic. When she reached for the door handle, it was then that she realized that this door had no handle, or at least none that she could easily find. 
As Carol's panic grew, Bundy took out a pair of handcuffs and slapped one around Carol's wrists. He then took out a gun and threatened to kill her. It was at this point that Carol decided she had to fight. Eventually, she was able to get the door open, and when she did, Carol took off running, which was a very, very good thing for Carol. Just four hours after her escape, Ted Bundy would kill another woman. Jeez. Carol would report this interaction to officials, and it would only be a matter of time before she could point her finger at the man who attempted to kill her. But the same night that Bundy attempted to kidnap Carol, Deborah Jean Kent's father handed her the keys to the family car. It was her job to pick up her brothers from a roller skating rink. Ted Bundy would admit to murdering Deborah and burying in her grave, but again, her remains have never been found. Then, Bundy would make the drive to Colorado in January of 1975. There, he would abduct a woman named Karen Campbell. Karen had been enjoying a ski trip with her fiancé and his children in Snowmass, Colorado. Around 6 p.m. on January 12th, after having eaten dinner out, Karen returned to the Willward Lodge where she and her soon-to-be family were staying. Carol decided to venture away from her group and go to her second floor room to retrieve a magazine. And she was never seen again. Karen's naked body was found a month later, frozen along a dirt road between Aspen and Snowmass. She had been beaten to death. There were marks on her wrists as though she had been tied up. She had been raped, and like other victims of Bundy's, at some point during the assault, she had been strangled. Then, on March 15th, a ski instructor from Vail, Colorado, would go missing. 26-year-old Julie Cunningham left her apartment in Apollo Park and headed to a local tavern. Wearing a brown suede jacket, blue jeans, boots, and a ski cap, Cunningham would never make it to the tavern. The night she had... <laughs> Will you go back? That night, she had the bad luck of running into Ted, who was posing as an injured skier, hobbling around on crutches, struggling with carrying ski boots. After convincing her to help, Bundy knocked her unconscious. Then, with her body, he traveled 80 miles outside of Vail, Colorado, to a remote location. There, he raped her. After Bundy was done sexually, he strangled her and disposed of her body in a shallow grave, which Bundy would claim was surrounded by trees somewhere near Rifle, Colorado. Mm -hmm. Julie Cunningham's remains have never been found. Then, on April 6, 1975, Denise Oliverson left her home in Grand Junction, Colorado, and set out by bike to her parents' home. Denise was wearing a green long-sleeve Indian print blouse and a pair of Levi's. She would never make it to her destination. Instead, her bike and shoes were discovered the following day, laying by some railroad tracks near the Fifth Street Bridge. According to the confession Ted Bundy gave days before his execution, Ted discarded Denise's body in a river. But alas, her remains have never been recovered. The FBI does seem to cooperate this part of Bundy's confession in that they have placed Bundy in Grand Junction, Colorado through April of 75. Um, when did he get into Colorado? Uh, January of 75. So in four months, less than four months, he killed three, four, three? three women. Does he leave Colorado at this time? Having left Colorado. Oh, hold on. Um, why did he come to Colorado? Did, I'm not actually see sure. Anything on that? So a lot of people speculate he officially is like responsible, claimed 30 bodies. People really think it's closer to 100. He would just get on a highway and drive. And I think that's what he did. And he wound up in Colorado from Utah and yeah. spent some time well, killing some ladies. Those mountains provide great opportunity to stop in and out. Um, without anybody noticing. What I can't get over is his first victim is a woman who is at a lodge. Like we have stayed in Frisco, Colorado mm -hmm. at some place probably relatively similar. Mm -hmm. yeah, and she literally, yeah. Straight from the 70s. She <laughs> still is. <laughs> it is. It's lovely. I want to go back. She literally just leaves her group to walk up some stairs to get a magazine and he's able to abduct her, never seen by anybody. I could see that happening there. Even that's, now, even now with so many people there blowing. compared to then, um, it, it's, 
No, I, I could like imagine. Like a woman walking to a tavern at night. I can see that. Yeah. A girl on a bike can see that. But a woman at a lodge, yeah. he has the audacity to be like, nope, let's, let's everything take this we, one. Everything we know about um, his kills right now, um, yeah, there's nothing there that says he couldn't have or more likely would have had a much higher kill number. The only thing is, is, uh, well, actually, no, that's, we'll talk about that later. But, um, during his ex, like, cause doesn't he give all of this information close to his execution? Mm, yes. Uh, yeah. Um, but the way, especially when you look at that first year and the fact that they could like corroborate it with bodies, mm -hmm. um, if you need a cough, you can cough. I know. Sorry, people. I'm under the weather. <laughs> No, she's getting I'm here over. for you though. She's getting over cold, but I am. But she's uh pushing through for yes. a good old But I got my grapefruit juice, getting that vitamin C. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's lemon juice in that. Mm -hmm. you know, okay. Vitamin C. But yeah, no, I, I definitely I do definitely could see the, it, just his frenzy. It's crazy. Like, well, that we're not first even... year, what was his number in the first year that they actually corroborated? It was we're like 10, nine, like eight 10 or nine, or 11, 10, something like something, that. Yeah. yeah. Where I, th I think there was a couple bodies they couldn't find, but everything else was found. <sighs> That's a lot. Yes. <laughs> okay. Right. So having left Colorado, Ted Bundy checked into a Holiday Inn in Idaho under an alias. At that time, Idaho was experiencing an unseasonably cold and rainy spring. That factor, coupled with Ted's lack of familiarity with the area, was causing Ted to become very frustrated as he was struggling to find his next victim. Ted Bundy had approached several possible victims in Pocatello, Idaho, while pretending to be a lost motorist, but Bundy was having no success. Then on May 6th, Bundy found himself at Alameda Junior High School. As Bundy sat in his Volkswagen bug, parked outside the school, he spotted a 12-year-old 7th grade student leaving campus for her lunch break. After a brief conversation, Lynette Culver got into Bundy's car. Investigators believe that Bundy sexually assaulted the young girl before drowning her in his hotel bathtub, which is completely not Bundy's M.O. Yeah, jeez Louise. Which, um, you see... It's like when he gets on frenzies, all of a sudden he's breaking and yeah. it doesn't matter anymore. And we kind of saw it a little bit last episode. Um, I think you just see it every now and then, just like he, he gets, that's he turns absolutely into absolutely a, a theme. I'm he's already a madman, but he turns into the yeah. matter of the men that lives inside his head. Yes. That is lured out by alcohol. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now, according to Bundy, after Lynette died, he put her body into the trunk of his car, and after driving for a while, he threw her body into the Snake River. Her remains were never recovered. From Idaho, Bundy returned to Utah. It was there in Provo, Utah, that Bundy would find another victim. 15-year-old Susan Curtis had been attending the Bountiful Orchard Youth Conference at Brigham Young University. After a formal banquet, Susan decided to walk about a quarter mile back to her dorm so that she could brush her teeth, like a good Mormon girl would. Mm. Later that evening, after she was reported missing, investigators would find a completely dry toothbrush, indicating that whatever happened to Susan happened before she made it back to her dorm. Ted Bundy would confess to killing the freshman girl, she was a freshman in high school, who was a member of the track team. And I added this because I find it fascinating. Girls baseball team in 1975. <laughs> Sorry, people. They said baseball team? She, girls baseball team. Not softball? No. <laughs> so Interesting. I wonder if it was actually baseball. Uh, everything's or if they just true on the internet. Softball team baseball. Now, according to Ted, Susan's body is buried along a highway in Price, Utah. But sooner than Ted would have liked, he came into direct contact with law enforcement. Ted Bundy's first arrest would come early one Saturday morning in August of 1975. Utah Highway Patrol Sergeant Bob Hayward would write this in his incident report. <clears throat> 
I was coming off shift and was sitting in my patrol car in front of my house on Hogan Street in Granger. I noticed a gray VW pass me slowly, going south with its lights off. I checked the license plate but did not recognize that car. After about 10 minutes, the sheriff called for some assistance. As I was going up Brock Street, a VW took off, going north at a high rate of speed. I pursued him, also at a high rate of speed. I had the red light on when he ran the stop sign, but he just went as fast as a Volkswagen would go. I pulled up on him fast, and he finally pulled over into a gas station. He produced his driver's license, which identified him as Theodore Robert Bundy, 565 First Ave, Salt Lake City. The man was wearing dark pants, a black turtleneck with long sleeves and sneakers. He said he was lost in the subdivision, but he had been there for 10 minutes, only a block away from me on Brock Street. End quote. (laughs) Well done. Thank you. (laughs) You sucked me right into that officer's uh, head. And him writing that. (laughs) (laughs) Now, after Bundy consented to a search of his vehicle, the officer found that the passenger seat had been removed and was lying on its side in the back. A satchel was recovered from the floor, and this satchel contained the following items. An ice pick, a pair of nylon pantyhose that had holes cut out as though for a pair of eyes and a mouth, a ski mask, strips of material, and lengths of rope. In the trunk... The officer recovered a pair of handcuffs and a 14 inch crowbar was found tucked beneath the driver's seat. Wow. (laughs) Tell me you're a serial killer without telling me you're a serial killer. Look, even if your mind doesn't go straight to serial killer, at least house robber. (laughs) Well, that's what he's going to be charged with. So Bundy tried to tell the officer and the backup deputy who had been called that he had been at the Valley View Drive, drive drive-in theater, um, watching a movie called The Towering Inferno. Mm -hmm. The only problem with that story was that that movie was not showing that night. So when Ted was presented with this fact, Bundy changed his tune and claimed to have simply been driving around lost. (laughs) Lost. (laughs) So you went back to the original thing. So I think the, no, so the officer put, in oh. his notes, like he said he was lost. Yeah, he didn't he add didn't that add extraneous that. story that this guy lied and said he was at a movie theater. I'm guessing this is a very small town <laughs> he's in because the officer made it sound like, like, how are you lost? Like, Well, he also, so the officer was sitting in front of his house. Like he had just gotten home and yeah. saw this suspicious VW bug. And he was like, I don't recognize that car. Like that car shouldn't be driving around my neighborhood this time of night. And I think that's what prompted him. And then as he goes to leave, I think Bundy got spooked. And that's why Bundy took off. And he was like, oh, no, no, no. Yeah. This guy is up to no good. Yeah. Now, Bundy's explanation was not fooling either officer. Bundy was arrested at first for evading arrest. But ultimately, officers would add the charge of being in possession of burglary tools. That's a... That's a charge? Apparently in Utah in 1975. In burglary yeah. tools that is so weird i wonder if they have a list like that they check off they're like if you have so many of these then yes you'll be charged yep could you imagine like being like a contractor like, yep oh shit i got like five of them <laughs> dang it all right uh i gotta put why this do you in. have this mask i have sir? to put these things because in sometimes your car there's dust <laughs> <laughs> oh man that's so weird well this arrest would be the beginning of the end for Ted Bundy. With this arrest, connections were being made between the Ted, who is reportedly serial murdering women out of Washington, the Ted, who attempted to kidnap Carol Durant, and the Ted Bundy, who had just been arrested with suspicious items in his VW bug driving along a dark street in Utah. You might not know this, but um, I've noticed now between last episode and now we've got three different colors for his vw did he have no different bugs? so at up till this point it's the exact same volkswagen bug really? now i'm gonna so tell brown, you and that, somebody says it's yellow yes, and then he says it's gray the but police it's, officer but i think it's all 
firsthand account, like eyewitness, yeah. what I see is different. Yeah. It's the blue, oh, black dress versus white, well, gold dress situation of the internet circa 2012. <laughs> I don't see the same colors you see. I don't, I don't know if it's that far, but it is the, it's the, the exact weird same phenomena vibe. that like you can have multiple witnesses witness one yes. thing and they will like remember something such as colors yes. and stuff different. Now I will tell you, Ted Bundy had a very weird like attraction to Volkswagen bugs because ultimately when he winds up in Florida, he will steal another Volkswagen bug, but not the first Volkswagen bug that he sees because he actually sees one that's like very well taken care of. And like the owner clearly put money into like souping it up. And he was like, oh, I can't steal that. That That's owner loves that bug. No, he was like that owner. Oh yeah, they'll has taken gone. care of that yeah. bug, so I can't. But he stole oh, another. You're saying he's oh, like he... I respect. Yes, and he was the... like I'm not going to take this person's VW bug because they clearly love it as much as I love my VW bug. <laughs> yes, but it's the same is bug. That up your in... theory, no, or is that this like is what he's I'm assuming kind of... he told Anne Rule this because wow. she retells it in her in her oh, book. Wow. How funny. No, but he 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 gets all the way to Florida at some point, it's completely incognito, and homeboy is going to steal a VW buck. Like, come on. Now, despite maintaining his innocence to people like Elizabeth, his former girlfriend back in Washington, and his friend Ann Rule, who was still at the time collecting information in order to write about the missing and murdered women in Washington— Bundy's judicial future was not looking very bright. In October of 1975, Carol DeRanche identified none other than Theodore Robert Bundy as the man who attempted to kidnap her in November the year before. So after being charged with the aggravated kidnapping and attempted criminal assault of Carol, Bundy would choose to have a bench trial, meaning that he waived his right to a jury and at that trial's culmination, Bundy would be found guilty on March 1st. His sentence? A minimum of one to a maximum of 15 years in the Utah State prison system. But Bundy's criminal justice system woes were only beginning. In October of 1976, after being charged with Karen Campbell's murder, that was back in Snowmass, Colorado, Bundy was moved to Aspen, which is another mountain town in Colorado, where he would stand trial. Bundy pleaded not guilty and decided that he would assist in his own defense. In order to allow him to do so, Bundy was given access to the jailhouse law library. It was this set of circumstances that put Bundy in a very opportune situation. In June of 1977, Bundy would jump from the second story window of the jailhouse and after falling 15 feet to the ground, Bundy would flee into the Colorado wilderness. And it was the second story of the jailhouse, but it was the library section, right? Yes. Where there was no one watching him. Well, there actually were like employees who actually told somebody like, hey, this dude looks awfully suspicious when he's in here. And nobody, but nobody did actually saw him jump out the window, right? Like there was nobody in the room with them when he did it. You know, that's a great question. I actually think somebody was in the room. You do? I do. I've always heard it that nobody was in there. And I'm assuming somebody would be in there watching. I don't know, but he was able to jump out a window. Um, <laughs> nobody stopping him. Like, well, he was able to get like away. And into like the Rocky Mountain wilderness where he survived for several days. Like and he will tell pretty, he told grand tales about how he like broke into cabins and like took a shotgun and was hiding like 15 yards away from people looking for him. Which is total, totally pro, pro, uh, plausible um, <laughs> knowing the Rocky Mountains and how they were. There's tons of cabins where people own right. the cabin, but they're not there year round. I just don't think Bundy was as badass as he tried to present because after realizing he was not made to survive in the wild, Bundy actually returned to Aspen where he stole a car. But after running into a police checkpoint set up to find the escaped Ted Bundy, he simply turned himself in. That's where it ends? No. Well, for the I time know, for, being. For the Colorado escape? Well, 
No. After being taken into custody, Bundy would be sent to Glenwood Springs, Colorado. And on June 15th, 1977, Bundy would add escape, burglary, and felony theft to the mounting list of charges he was facing. And through it all, Bundy maintained his innocence. It would take Bundy six months to lose enough weight to escape through a light feature in the ceiling of his jail cell. Thanks to the books and other items under his blanket on his cot, Bundy was well on his way east before anyone even noticed he was gone. Oh, my gosh. So, so he twice got, he, he got... escaped in Colorado. <coughs> Do <Jeez>. better Colorado. <laughs> Sorry for coughing in the microphone. Um, I choked on my, my death row. <laughs> uh, all right. So the second one I'm hearing right. Um, and again, there's so many details to Ted Bunny. Like you can't remember them all. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's been a while since I've watched anything on him. But it was a light fixture. Yeah, and he got he real got, skinny. He got through. Or I'm guessing he took the light fixture off, climbed through the hole, and got out of the jail. And he had placed books and stuff under his blanket, so everybody thought he was just asleep. Light fixtures must have been different back then. <laughs> well, apparently he lost about the a light crap ton of weight. I, it's still, like light fixtures now are like, I don't know, six inches wide. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, uh, like for the hole, you know, yeah. the, for it to fit into the uh, little box it goes into. Yeah. But yeah, uh, that's impressive. Then that's after. Impressive. <laughs> Jeez, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> In awe of the goat. To- Two times in Colorado. Twice in Colorado, which is just come on Colorado because well, we that's where we live. And I'd like to think that they could keep hold yeah. of murder victims. But with, uh, I wonder, when was that. Supermax? Um, do you have any idea when that came around in Colorado? Because we have one of the Well, most... he can't be sent to a Supermax prison until he is right. convicted. But, but we of we're said a state crimes. that takes in... Uh, and I don't know about then. I don't know when it was made, but we're a state that takes in uh, some of the most notorious criminals, where they sent them to the supermax prison uh, in the in the mountains. And I don't know. You would think like the rest of the state would take cue on like what are they doing? But I guess you know. Actually, he can't prison? be sent to prison until he's convicted oh. of a felony charge in Colorado, right? He. Right. He's not convicted yet. I didn't think of that part. Plus, all prisons are privatized. So it's a business. Only They're as all good different. as the man running the show. Yep. <laughs> so after flying to Chicago, Bundy took a train to Ann Arbor, Michigan, where he stole a car and left the cold climate of the north for warmer temperatures in Tallahassee, Florida. In Florida, Ted Bundy had the opportunity to start over. No one in Florida was looking for the escaped man out of Colorado wanted for murder. He could have created a new identity. And if he had been able to stay out of trouble, he could have bought himself several years of freedom, if not remained an uncaptured, wanted killer for the rest of his life. But that peaceful future was not in the cards for Theodore Bundy. As Chris Hagen, Ted tried to acclimate to his new life. He rented a small, shabby room and decided that he needed to find work, preferably something in construction, which I can only assume was because there weren't any ladies with long brown hair parted in the middle working on construction sites. (laughs) Keep me away from all the females. (laughs) But this one alias of Chris Hagen must not have been enough for the wanted fugitive because after searching through the records of graduates from Florida State University, Ted found his next identity, Kenneth Misner, taking him one step closer to the co-eds he sought to hunt. As Kenneth Misner, Bundy lived a very simple life. But after jail, the simple life seemed to fit, at least for a while. The simple beer that he could drink in the evenings was worth whatever he had to trade to stay undetected. Eventually, however, Bundy's old habits began to reappear. For one, instead of finding employment, Ted, as Misner, began stealing again, including a beat up old bike, items from the grocery store, and to make ends meet, Bundy would steal women's wallets while they were shopping. 
Eventually, Bundy crescendoed to stealing multiple cars to get around Tallahassee. So many cars, in fact, that Bundy would not be able to count the number in retrospect. What did he do? Just steal it? Drive where he needed to go? Leave it. Off and go where he needed to go? Yes. And what's the timeline on this? He So from when he got into Florida and uh, when he's getting active in criminal activity? It's actually a very short time period. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now, when did he get into Florida? What what like month do you recall? That is a wonderful question. Um when did he escape? It was June. So so, so he was taken back into custody in June. Six months later he escaped. So it was right after the new year in seventy eight. He okay. got to Florida. So in January of seventy eight, he got yes. into Florida. Yep. Okay. Now, Ted's new life was a very, very lonely life, except for an unemployed rock band who lived down the hall from his small room. Ted could not afford to interact with many other people. But eventually, Ted Bundy could not ignore that nagging itch within him to hunt, to destroy, and to kill. So it was during the early morning hours of January 15th. So we're looking at two weeks, a little longer, 1978 that Ted Bundy approached the Chi Omega House, which sat just outside the Florida State University campus. Bundy entered the dark and quiet home through a back door that was accessible through a faulty latch. At around 2.45 a.m., Ted entered the first bedroom carrying a piece of oak firewood that he had picked up from a pile outside the home. Inside the room was a sleeping Marguerite Bowman. Ted Bundy sexually assaulted Marguerite before strangling her with a nylon stocking. Before leaving Marguerite's room, Bundy pulled the sheets up to her neck to make it appear as though the co-ed was simply asleep. Next, Ted entered Lisa Levy's room, where he would quickly take a second life during those early morning hours. Lisa was beaten, her skull crushed by the piece of wood, and then she was sex sexually assaulted with a hair mist bottle before being strangled to death. When investigators would examine her body, they would note that one of Lisa's nipples was torn and there was a deep bite mark on one of her buttocks. You're making a face. I, well, we all know about the bite mark, um, but uh, the, the hair mist bottle, that's where... My face came from. I'm assuming that so soon after sexually assaulting his first victim, Ted Bundy wasn't capable physically of assaulting this one. He was uh, so through, he used a called? proximal Fra- fracturing period. Yeah, the refractory period. The refractory period. Um, so he used a different device. Um, and all right, so uh, just he escaped in June of. His first escape was no, the second escape. That would have been six months after he had been captured. So six months after June is Jan- early oh. January. So he went right to Florida. Right to Florida. And so he's in jail for six months between them from escaping. Yeah. Before that, there's probably like a month or two that he was captured or you know, brought in and charged. But prior to that, he had spent an amount of time in a Utah prison for the attack on Carol Durange. So he's he's now at this point like almost a year without killing anybody. Mm-hmm. More than a year. It's more than yeah. And already we're at two girls one night. Oh, and we're I'm, not done. No, I know. Right yeah. now at mm-hmm. this point, that's yep. where we're at, and in. We're all we're also seeing like the uh unhinged yes, Ted Bundy. Don't steal my thunder. I got a through. really good line coming up. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Now Bundy then proceeded to move down the hallway, still not having aroused any inten- attention in the home. Then he entered room number eight, where roommates Kathy Kleiner and Karen Chandler were fast asleep. Kathy Kleiner actually woke to the sound of her door opening as Bundy pushed it ajar. Then, after he stumbled on a trunk that sat between the two beds, Kathy remembers being completely awake. 
In her own words, here is what she recalled in a 2019 interview. Quote, as I look up, I see this dark figure with a hand up, club in his hand. And before I knew it, he brought it down on me and attacked my face. I did not feel pain. It wasn't pain. It was more of a thud or a pressure at that point. At the sound of the commotion, Karen Chandler, the roommate, also woke up. Bundy quickly moved from Kathy over to Karen, where he began striking her with a piece of wood. It was then that a car pulled into the parking lot outside, and its lights happened to shine through the window. Bundy, fearing he had been seen, fled. As Kathy tried to call for help, it was clear that the damage to her jawbone was extreme. Her jaw had been shattered and was only connected to her skull by one fixed point. She recalls, quote, I was in my bed now, screaming for help, yelling for help, and all I was doing was making a gurgling sound, end quote. As Ted Bundy ran out the front door of the sorority house, Nita Neary, who was returning home from her day around 3.15 a.m., watched as Bundy, carrying a bloody wooden weapon, escaped into the night. It was uninjured sorority sisters who'd call the police around 3.20 a.m. Now, some might think that the carnage at the Chi Omega sorority house would have quenched the thirst or fed the hunger that was within the monster Ted Bundy. Alas, those people have not been paying attention. Because if there is one thing that stands consistent about Theodore Robert Bundy, it's that his entire life was an escalation towards a horrific zenith, that point being this night. Earlier that night, a Florida State University dance major, Cheryl Thomas, had gone out to a disco with her friends. After returning home, the young dancer made herself an open-faced peanut butter and honey sandwich that she intended to eat as she watched some television. Climbing through a kitchen window, Bundy entered Cheryl's home. He pulled off the pantyhose he was wearing over his face and dropped it on the ground. In the frenzied attack that followed, Bundy broke Cheryl's jaw and severed a nerve in her left ear. Upon hearing the attack, Cheryl's neighbor tried to call her, and when she didn't get an answer, she called the police. Cheryl was found, left for dead, but breathing. Her injuries, however, would end any hope of a future dance career. And still, Bundy was not done. On February 8th, 1978, 12-year-old Kimberly Leach was at school. That day, she would become the 19th and final victim. That we can be sure of. Mm -hmm. That day, Kimberly had been called to return to her homeroom where she had left her purse behind. At some point during this task, Kimberly was lured into a white van. By Ted Bundy. When the white van was discovered later, investigators believed there were marks inside that indicated that something had been dragged from within. Then, after connecting dirt and leaves from inside the van as belonging to trees and soil from the Sawani River State Park, officer loca- officers located the clothed remains of Kimberly Leach. Her body showed signs of sexual assault prior to her having her throat cut. Then, after her death, Ted Bundy mutilated her genital region with a knife. Finally, on February 15, 1978, Pensacola police officer David Lee would spot a vehicle that had been reported missing. Ted Bundy, the driver of this vehicle, was not so ready to give up and, when confronted, would resist arrest, warranting Officer Lee to fire two warning shots. And so, Ted Bundy would be apprehended and arrested. Despite Bundy's initial refusal to identify himself, Theodore Robert Bundy would be charged in the Chi Omega murders and attacks. The trial for the murders at the Chi Omega sorority house began in June 1979. Ted Bundy would make the decision to represent himself. And as such, the media became very, very interested. The trial would become the first televised 
Nash, wait, we go back. Ah, I corrected myself several times. I can get this one. This trial would become the first trial televised nationally in the United States. Nearly 250 reporters from five different continents covered the proceedings. Continents, not consonants. I think I said consonants. (laughs) (laughs) Now, acting as his own attorney, Bundy seemed to steal the focus of the trial. He showed off his intelligence, his legal expertise, and utmost, he showed off his charm. Being his own attorney also allowed Bundy to cross-examine his former victims, providing Ted with a new way to induce terror to the women he previously attacked. Um, I, I don't even, I, I've got a lot of thoughts. I don't want to, you know, we've obviously got a lot of information to go about, but the terrorizing his previous victims that didn't die. Like the two roommates. Do you think he did that on purpose? Do you think? I think he did it on purpose. Yeah. And do you think? He decided to represent himself because he thought that highly of himself, or was he trying to like find another way to escape? I think it was a variety of things. I think he thought himself that intelligent, smarter than everybody else. He could get himself found not guilty. I also think he had a sadistic um, need to continue to terrorize these women because he couldn't do anything inside a jail cell. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I remember the what I was going to say, then it spaced me and I had that long pause. Um, <laughs> I said I Michael Scott had made up something else. Uh, so what got him, how did they charge him on the uh, murders at the, the fraternity? Because at this, like, as far as, like, where he was caught, Pensacola and... And all that, like, what details were they, like, tying back to that? I think that? once they had him arrested, and it was nobody actually saw that him, right? he was, well, we're going to talk about the evidence. But I think once they finally identified him as Theodore Robert Bundy, that name was known in the system as somebody who was wanted out of Colorado for murdering right. women. Right. And so I think it just fit. But. Let's get into it because I'm going to share what I think will be an incredibly unpopular opinion. (laughs) Probably. And that is the evidence, like Ted Bundy absolutely did it, but the evidence against him was minimal at best. And had our justice system worked the way it was supposed to work, he should never have been convicted. On that. But he still would have gone back to Colorado. Yes, all of that. But uh, let's just talk about the evidence for a second. So there were no fingerprints. There was no murder weapon. We're talking about Chi Omega right now. Yeah. There was a blood type that was recovered. There were fingerprint smudges and even sperm was collected. But all of that evidence proved inconclusive. Now, one piece of evidence presented at trial was the eyewitness testimony provided by Nita Neary, that sorority sister who's returning home from her date, who saw Ted Bundy leave. Now, this sorority sister provided a description and a sketch was created based on what she could provide. Now, I'm just going to ask that you take a look at this sketch and I'd like you to describe what you see. Is that open? Okay, I got it open. (laughs) This was her eyewitness testimony sketch. That's what she saw that night. Uh, what? what do you see? What do you see there? A really amateur sketch of a dude <laughs> opening a two door. Um, Can you see any details about his hair? Doorway. <coughs> he has. It's either a. Uh, could be a beanie. Could also be a bike helmet. <laughs> it could be a nylon, like stocking that he's pulled up. I suppose you can't see his hair. Now it looks like he's either carrying a. Uh, 
a rolled up uh, newspaper yep. or m- some sort of piece of wood. And we can see he has one eye, at least because it's in the periphery. He's got a nose. A real sharp nose. And a mouth. But other than that, are you telling me, looking at that drawing, you would go, oh my gosh, that's Ted Bundy. If I were in law enforcement or a lawyer, I would not even pay attention to this when it comes to the trial. And you have to remember, she is a sorority sister. She's getting home late. It's a dark house. She might be able to see a figure with a cap on and the side of his face. But you're telling me she could pick out Ted Bundy. And I'm not saying that that is any way. So this eyewitness, did she pick out Ted Bundy? Nope. This is, this is what she provided. This is what she provided. They mm-hmm. didn't do a lineup or anything. Not that I'm aware of. That's, I don't know. <laughs> it's weird. Law enforcement gets it right every now and then when they just go off their hunch. You know? No, he absolutely um, did it. He absolutely did it. But and it's his this... criminal history that suggests he's the one responsible for this yeah. action. When... But that's not what our justice system is supposed to be about. That's all I'm saying. Right. But when I mentioned before, um, you know, I said when the police would get lucky, law enforcement, all of the justice system would get lucky to get Ted Bundy. The luck is that Ted Bundy represented himself because <laughs> a lawyer probably would have just demolished this. Well, we're going to see what the country felt it about would, him. It would also in a couple. Pages. Yeah, but he, a good lawyer, right? Um, wants his name to get it out there and you know get even Ted Bundy off. Um, probably could have gotten past this, and I'm just guessing, but his other cases probably didn't have a whole lot of evidence against him either. Yeah. Yeah. Like if he didn't represent himself. Well, we'll never know because this, this and the, the uh, Kimberly trial are the only trials he actually undergoes. Mm -hmm. Now the most damning, the key piece of evidence in this double murder trial was the bite mark left on the buttock of victim Lisa Levy. Now I am not even going to go into the fact that bite mark analysis has been completely debunked as having no real basis in science and simply point out that the actual tissue specimens had been lost before trial even began. And the only evidence of the bite mark that anybody had to go off of that was actually presented during the trial came from a photograph taken of Lisa's backside after a police officer laid a yellow ruler next to the bite wound the night of the attack. But it completely is this, matched Ted Bundy's. Is this the only job. case that no, it's they've, been used? No. Bite marks? N- no, no. They've, they've done it various times, but as of now, I don't think you would get that through any criminal trial whatsoever. I don't think it's allowed as evidence. Because it's not valid. Yeah, I think shortly after this, they. I could be wrong on this, but I could, I can swear, like probably on the documentaries I've watched on this, that they point that out. Like that's not admissible evidence anymore. No. And that was really all the evidence presented against Ted Bundy Jeez, at the murder trial. However, it was enough for Bundy to be found guilty and then sentenced to death twice for both murder victims. You think there's something um, to the eyes of a serial killer that the jury could see? Were they uh, uh, okay? Before I ask that, were they allowed to admit any evidence from his previous charges or mention I... the previous charges? I don't. Because that would sway a jury as well. But at this point, it's probably such national news that they... But to assume that the jury didn't didn't know, know. I think would be foolish. Um, Um, First, you talked about his eyes. The the eyes of a serial killer. There has... I just want to point out... something there that the jury's just like... That at various times... a lot of people. I know we're talking over each other. Sorry, Jess. Sorry, sorry. Um, Sorry, crowd. (laughs) When people would talk to Ted Bundy, his pupil would expand or darkness would spread and 
people would visibly watch as Ted Bundy's eyes just became black. When he did what? Just talking. Oh, just talking. Yeah. To I, just various people. No, I just, wouldn't say it's a court, but oh, I remember just, people going, has anybody ever told you that your eyes change? And he'd be like, yeah, people have told me that. I don't think, I don't think he presented as anything but a showy narcissist. I just think people believed he had committed these crimes and that's why he was found guilty. To be honest. I don't know. It's hard for me to believe that with the evidence presented, I mean, I, I, they had to have at least like been able to say he was in the area. I'm sure. And he was witness saying he was there, around the area. Mm-hmm. Um, but the bite, I, well, a good lawyer can and have the sign, you know, can but, explain it in a certain way and have a scientist go up there and explain it in a yes. very good way that, no, this is science. It's irrefutable. But I think those that's... are his teeth marks, which again, your human skin doesn't hold an imprint, like a, an exact imprint of anything. I think, it bruises and it bleed like it bleeds out. There's no way to, and that's why it's not to be even honest, a thing anymore. I think it's a faulty part of our judicial system is you can find an expert and if you pay them enough, they're going to say basically whatever you want them to say. And I think in the 70s, it wasn't a forethought of let's hire an expert and dispute this person. This person is a scientist. This person is a doctor. Uh, right. We're going to let them say what they want to say. Right. And there wasn't enough previous, like, criminal history where anybody would feel confident going, no, we're going to go hire our own expert. We're going to see what they have to say. Yeah. That's what I think. And I think people just wanted him to die. Yeah. But that's, I guess that's why I just keep talking about it. It's because it's it's so interesting to me. We're not done because we've got one more trial I want us to discuss. Ted Bundy would endure another trial for the murder of young Kimberly Leach. The evidence in this case seemed to be stronger, and yet it leaves me with questions. The prosecution presented 65 eyewitnesses that connected Bundy directly or indirectly to Kimberly Leach the day she disappeared. However, the most crucial eyewitness to the state's case was a man named Clarence Anderson, And he was the individual who said he saw Bundy leading Kimberly to a white van. But his testimony would become a main point in Bundy's ultimate appeal. You see, Clarence Anderson had come forward to police after seeing a news report about Bundy and the missing girl. However, when interviewed by police, Clarence reported that he couldn't actually remember when he saw this event happening nor could he actually describe Bundy, nor could he actually describe the girl Bundy had allegedly led to a van. But the state was not deterred, so they actually put Clarence under hypnosis. And as a result of said hypnosis session, Clarence's recollection magically seemed to match the state's version of events. Now, the appeal Bundy filed absolutely acknowledged that Clarence's evidence should never have been admitted at trial, but they didn't give Bundy a new trial. Mm. Now, in addition to all those eyewitness testimonies, I have no idea how 65 people saw Ted with a young girl the day she went missing, but there were some pieces of fiber evidence submitted during the trial. Fibers taken from Kimberly's body matched fibers found in the white van, which matched fire fibers found on clothing that Bundy allegedly wore during the crime. One of the standout moments during the trial, however, had nothing to do with the actual crime. Ted Bundy actually proposed to his new girlfriend, Carol Ann Boone, while she was serving as a character witness for him. Then, while Carol was still on the stand, the two exchanged vows, legally making them husband and wife per Florida law. (laughs) So Ted Bundy got married during his second murder trial, during the actual trial, to a woman on the stand testifying that Bundy wasn't capable of murder. 
And now the pair had actually met several years before in 1974 while both were working for the Washington State Department of Emergency Services. And if you were ever wondering how Bundy managed to have money after his second escape, the answer may just be Carol Ann, according to a Rolling Stones article, who believes she was instrumental in that escape from Glenwood Springs, Colorado. Holy cow. And this couple would produce a daughter in October of 1982. Her name is Rose, or Rosa, as she has also been called. At that trial's end, Ted Bundy would be convicted yet again of murder and sentenced to death, but this time for Kimberly Leach. Now, for a significant amount of time of Ted Bundy's life on death row, he maintained his innocence. Then, on January 22, 1989, Ted Bundy made confessions. Confessions to killing 30 women, many of which connected him to the murders described in this podcast. At that time, Bundy only confessed to 30 deaths, but experts believe he could be responsible for as many as 100 missing and murdered women. When did he confess to these? Two days before his execution. Wow. So he maintained his innocence the whole time. The second trial, did he do the same thing where he's representing yes. himself? Yep. And did he have any other lawyers? I can't remember. Oh, I'm sure he, I'm sure whatever judge like, like proceeded, have. he had to have yeah. uh, like a barred attorney. Otherwise, in appeal, he could say he wasn't represented by a good attorney. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Myself. I wasn't an attorney. The judge allowed it. I never graduated law school. That's not okay. (laughs) Yeah. Although you you would think that you waive your right to appeal for that reason if you represent yourself. Yeah, I don't think that's how it works. You would think it would. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you think a lot of things about how the justice system should work, and it doesn't. I used to have so much faith in it. and then I grew up and learned a bunch of stuff. (laughs) It's like, oh my gosh. Now, that series of confessions would not be the last time Ted Bundy spoke out on his crimes. The night before his execution, Ted Bundy would participate in an interview with Christian evangelist Reverend James Dobson at Bundy's invitation. In this interview, Bundy seems to take responsibility for his actions, discuss finding God, Talk about his normal Christian upbringing while simultaneously casting blame for his actions on the violent pornography he had been exposed to as a child. Now, I'm just going to play a tiny snippet, and this is what Bundy tried to convince Dobson of and what Dobson was so ready to receive. In this interview, Bundy seems to take responsibility for his action while discussing his newfound faith in God and his normal good Christian upbringing while simultaneously casting blame for all of his actions on the violent pornography that he had been exposed to at a young age. Here is what Bundy had to say in his own words. My experience with pornography generally, like an addiction, which is harder, harder, something which gives you a greater sense of excitement. Until you reach the point where the pornography only goes so far, you begin to wonder if maybe actually doing it will give you that which is beyond just reading about it or looking at it. Basically, I was a normal person. I think people need to recognize those of us who are who have been influenced by pornographic violence are not some kinds of inherent monsters. We are your sons and we are your husbands. We grew up in regular families. And pornography can reach out and snatch a kid out of any house today. It snatched me out of my home. But I've lived in prison for a long time now. And I've met a lot of men who were motivated to commit violence just like me. And without exception, every one of them was deeply involved in pornography without question, without exception deeply influenced and consumed by an addiction to pornography. Tim, what would your life have been like without that influence? It would have been a lot better for me and lots of other people. I know that I had lots of other innocent people, victims and families. A life that would not have involved this kind of violence that I have been, that I have committed. My experience with... 
So the actual interview is significantly longer than that. And if you were paying close attention, it sounded like it was kind of chunked together, which it absolutely was. But it absolutely summarizes Bundy's entire interview with Dr. Dobson. And to be very honest, I think Bundy is simply saying what he thinks Dr. Dobson wants him to say so that he will win support from Dobson. And that support might possibly lend itself to help Bundy win a stay of execution, which to be honest, I think he gave his confession a few days earlier in hopes that that would help him win a stay of execution. And I, to be very honest, think Ted Bundy, while he might be speaking from from like some inherent truth, is kind of full of BS that entire time. I agree. Um, I, I was shown that interview, um, at a younger age Mm because I grew up in a Christian household. Dr. Dobson was very much part of that household, uh, as he was many, many other hundreds of thousands of other Christians. Um, and it was almost, it's almost championed as like, Oh, God could save Ted Bundy. Yeah. And he could save anybody. But then there was also the championing, championing of the uh, harm that pornography can do. For, it was the villainization. To, yeah, to uh, to mankind. While there is certainly some harm that can be done from pornography, um, it is not in any way uh, attributed to psychopaths deciding that they need to murder people. And I don't otherwise think, there would be a uh, a shit ton of murder of Ted Bundy's out. right now, especially <laughs> like we're we're growing murderers every yeah. day because we can't protect our sons from seeing this awful stuff yes. on the internet. Like it's I guess I haven't heard that since I've become a father, which is crazy because well, especially since I've had, uh, maybe not since I've become a father, but may, uh, since I've had a son and I had a son for quite a while. And so I'm constantly thinking of this stuff. Like, and I'm thinking of like the rampant, uh, access to oh, pornography yeah. now compared yeah. to when I was a kid, which right. when I was a kid, it was still like, uh, it, it wasn't the easiest thing to get, but you could get it. You could see it, you, could, you know, uh, especially at a very young age. Um, also, I call bullshit on all of it because are you kidding me, dude? Are you, is your is your father getting snuff films? Right. Is that what you were seeing? Yeah. No, you weren't. You weren't seeing anybody being murdered on films. You weren't seeing like, OK, maybe you saw a lady get slapped a little bit here and there. But that wasn't like that wasn't prevalent at that time. What you saw was like stuff out of. I, the old film <laughs> Deep Throat, like it, it was like, well, it, it it's an actual like went to theater, like real theaters. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But um, it's it's what we okay. think of. Sorry. Ted Bundy's talking just, from my just computer. Went, <laughs> went, went to the interview again. I'm just saying that he didn't have access to what he's saying he has access to. Here's what I'm going to say. First, if you watch it, I think Ted Bundy expresses himself through his face. And I think the Mm. entire time you can read these small nuances that make you go, yeah, I don't even think Ted Bundy believes what he's saying. No, you could hear it in his voice. And I think sounds um Dobson was just taking advantage of it in hopes that it would turn into something. Which I can't I hope Dobson wasn't like trying to turn it into something. He just did the interview. But. You might have been shown that as a child. The first time I was shown that, I don't know if you remember, Jason and I were married rather quickly. Oh, that was and, the first time you saw that? Yes. Oh, man. And I was pregnant with our child, and I didn't know his parents very well because it happened really, really quick. And my father-in-law, who knew, who she knew likes... that I liked Ted Bundy and all things serial killer, was like, hey, let me show you. He's God this can, DVD of Ted Bundy. New daughter-in-law here. God <laughs> and I can watched save it Ted Bundy your, too. No, I don't even think he tried to present it that way. He just was like, hey, I have an interview with Ted Bundy. 
He was just trying to connect with you. Yep. And I was very pregnant and I watched it in your parents' great room and I was very tired because I was growing a human being and I fell asleep to Ted Bundy's voice. (laughs) You fell asleep? Yes. Next to to my (laughs) father-in-law. Uh, so when I was in the room too, uh, <laughs> I, I do remember us watching yes. that. I don't remember you falling asleep. I did. That's I was funny. very tired. It's not a. a it's it's not long. It's very boring. Yes. It, like it, uh, here's the thing. I almost got more out of the hearing it than watching it at then, and it might have been at that age. We were much younger, you know, like twenty four, twenty five. Mm-hmm. No, definitely 24. Um, and I I almost like kind of believed seeing it, but just hearing it, I am hearing mm, I didn't believe it. This dude is rehearsed. He knows exactly what he wants to say. He he has paid, he has no time, like, or he has nothing but time. Sorry. He has nothing but time. So he's looking at the Christian culture and, and what are they looking at? And they were trying to like, like pornography and, you know, the rock and roll world and the, you know, just uh, uh, like a, too much skin on girls showing. They were trying to take it all down at the time. And he paid attention to that and he tried to hone in on it. Look. I I truly do believe God can save men yep. like Ted and maybe Bundy. Maybe he did, and maybe he did, but I don't believe this interview. Well, at all, I don't t- believe what he's saying on the interview. The Ted Bundy who faced imminent death hours before his early Tuesday morning execution was a very different person than the confident, showy narcissist who the nation saw during his trial. This Bundy was scared. He was crying and praying during the hours leading up to his death. In fact, a Methodist minister, Fred Lawrence, would join Bundy in his cell, and the two would pray together. During these hours before his execution, Bundy would call his mother Louise, his mother Louise, not his sister, in Tacoma two times to say goodbye. On the other end of the line, Louise would tell him, quote, you will always be my precious son, end quote. Carol Ann and Rose, on the other hand, had no contact with Bundy the night before his death, as Carol and Ted had divorced later on during his stay on death row. She had moved herself and Bundy's daughter Rose to Washington and had no further contact with him. Now that night at Florida State University, the college community celebrated Bundy's impending death with a cookout, grilling up Bundy burgers and electrified hot dogs, which were consumed under a large banner that read, quote, watch Ted fry, see Ted die. And if you recall, it was Florida State where the Chi Omega sorority house would be one of the last places where Bundy would attack. In Mountain Brook, Alabama, two police officers hosted a Bundy queue in support of capital punishment. And these two officers sold shirts that read, First Annual Bundy Barbecue. (laughs) After refusing to choose a last meal, Ted Bundy was fed the traditional last meal at 4.50 a.m. This meal consisted of a medium rare steak, eggs over easy, hash browns, butter toast with jelly, milk and juice. However, he did not touch any of it. Then at 7 a.m., On January 24th, 1989, he was led to the execution room where his right leg and head were shaved so that electrodes, which would carry the death-bringing current, could be attached to his skin. Then, with a startled look on his face, Bundy was strapped into the large wooden chair known as Old Sparky. At this time, outside the prison, a celebration was taking place. People drank coffee and beer while eating donuts. Shirts proclaiming Friday, (laughs) burn buddy burn, no, burn Bundy burn, (laughs) and toast Ted could be seen throughout the crowd. The crowd of people who were chanting and singing songs. Inside, Bundy was asked for his last words. And speaking to his lawyer and minister, Bundy stated, quote, 
Jim and Fred, I'd like you to give my love to my family and friends, end quote. A total of 42 spectators watched behind plexiglass. Then an anonymous executioner flipped old Sparky's switch, initiating 2,000 volts of electricity to pass through Bundy's body. About a minute later, at 7.16 a.m., the man responsible for so many horrific crimes was dead. Now, Bundy tried to explain his horrific actions by attributing them to the violent pornography he had been exposed to as a child. If you want to... Then, an anonymous executioner flipped Old Sparky's switch, initiating 2,000 volts of electricity to pass through Bundy's body. About a minute later, at 7.16 a.m., the man responsible for so many horrific crimes was dead. Hmm. Well, that's a lot of stuff that happened there. <clears throat> um, one thing I, I thought of, uh, going back to uh, him refusing or to pick a last meal mm-hmm. and then refusing to eat it. Um, and, and along with some of the other things he did, obviously he prayed with the priest, um, the wife and daughter no longer talking to him. A lot goes through my mind, but one of them is like, do you think in your opinion, do you think that he in not picking a last meal, um, was, in denial that he was going to go to his death? Or do you think that's more of a, I'm okay with going to my death? To be very honest, I think he was in absolute turmoil over the fact that this was the end of Ted Bundy. I don't think he, up until they were like leading him to the chamber, he thought this was how it was going to end. I think he legitimately felt sick. And that's why he didn't pick a last meal. Was the last meal to be picked like uh, how many days before? Do you have any idea? I'm not sure. Because I'd be curious about that compared to or uh, along with two days before his execution, he decides to confess to 30 murders. And then the day before he decides or was it the day of? No, it was the night. So the night before he Mm -hmm. decides to have this interview with Dobson. Um, it's interesting because like all of it could be taken as he's accepted his death, so he's going to get it all off his chest. See, and I think it's but the I, exact the, opposite. I do too, because the pornography thing actually, like, I think throws it off for me completely. It's such a like, especially what he. It's more of what he says and how he says it mm-hmm. that that throws throws it off because it just like pornography then even now like the majority of people are not looking at violent pornography that is actually very it's kind of hard to get and maybe not now but then for certainly well um but it's but still there's part of me like with the, the meal thing is where i'm like what is he doing there well, first of all, you made a face. I think his last meal sounds lovely. I love steak and eggs and hash browns and toast. Yeah, but usually that, that steak being said, that goes with that is not a good steak. I do. I think he physically could not eat. I don't think he had come to terms, which is why I'm yeah. never going to question somebody's faith in God. Like that's that is a you and that's a a podcast for a different day. But yeah. if he truly knew Jesus, fabulous. But the fact that he did not have peace enough to eat makes me think that he still was completely unresolved with the fact that he was about to leave planet Earth and whatever reality was out there for him was out there. And I don't think he was ready for it. I agree. That's where my thoughts land. My thoughts land that he could not accept that he was about to die. And the fact that it was going to happen, he pulled out all the stops that he could to maybe prevent it or make it go longer at least. Yeah. Uh, he didn't want to die. He didn't want to die. That's what I think as well. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, which is, I think it's strange. Like somebody that's caused so much death can't accept their own. 
Wow. I think it fits with who he was as a narcissist. Which is the uh, the price you pay. Yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> he got what was coming to him. Yeah. A little too late, too. Now, Bundy tried to explain his horrific actions by attributing them to the violent pornography that he had been exposed to as a child. And I'm sure it played a part. But there's another explanation that Bundy gave that I think captures Bundy's motive better than anything else. At different times, Bundy described the following, quote, the ultimate possession was, in fact, the taking of the life and then the physical possession of the remains, end quote. And at a different time, quote, when you feel that last bit of breath leaving their body, you are looking into their eyes. A person in that situation is God, end quote. And maybe it's the simplest explanation that is the most accurate. When asked by a guard why Bundy did what he did, Bundy simply answered, quote, I just like to kill. I wanted to kill, end quote. 